Can you inter- briefly uh, introduce? Uh, may, may I interrupt for a second? Sorry about this. These are very difficult days. Um, I've just come from Parliament. I have to go back. I don't have uh, much more than one hour altogether. So okay. it would be right for me to speak for an hour. That would be far too long. Um, so shall I confine myself to 30 minutes and then we can have a discussion? Your choice, actually. Uh, that was Mine was just a suggestion. Um, anyway, uh, so let's not waste time then. Uh, if you have only half an hour to uh, speak, because everybody knows who you are, uh, and you are our next door neighbor, uh, so you are quite well known here also. Uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, we are uh, listening to you. Well, th- thank you, and many apologies for um, this shortness of time. Uh, but you know, parliamentary politics is a, a very dirty job, and it's extremely time-consuming <laughs> at the same time. So uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. It gives me an opportunity to escape what I do on a daily basis, the daily grind of party politics. Uh, and therefore, a brilliant you know, little window into the world of ideas and deep thinking about broader issues. Uh, I shall be brutally honest with you. Um, I'm in the process of writing this book, of completing this book. I've got another three weeks before I'm supposed to hand it over to my publisher. Uh, and it's, it's, it's basic idea is uh, one that uh, enrages a lot of people, uh, not just on the right of politics, but also on the left of politics. And uh, um, I, cons- well, I confess to also being struck by the madness on the basic hypothesis I'm putting forward. But it's a hypothesis which I deeply believe in. I, it has grown on me. It began as a um, as a gut feeling. Uh, soon after 2008, to around 2010. And that, that gut feeling was that uh, 2008, the great financial crisis, as Australians call it, and we have Steve Keen, I can see you, Steve, in my little window. Um, the GFC, uh, the GFC in 2008 was for capitalism, that which 1991 was for the left, for socialism. A major irreversible defeat. Uh, yeah. that, that it was um, something akin to 1929, there is no doubt about that. Uh, it differs from 1929 in important ways. Uh, the most important one is, of course, that uh, the G7, the G20, and in particular their central bankers, um, went into hyperdrive in order to save the financiers, something that didn't happen in 1929. But otherwise, there are many, many similarities. Now, what is my hypothesis? My hypothesis is that um, while the left has proven utterly incompetent and unable to organize the overthrow of capitalism, that job has been performed gradually in a revolutionary style, by capital. Capital has overthrown capitalism. Now, those familiar with the thought of Karl Marx will not see this as a very crazy idea because it's part of the dialectical way of thinking. This kind of contradiction should be familiar to anyone who is uh, um, au fait with uh, Marx's uh, ideas on how history progresses through contradiction and through dialectical resolutions. Uh, But this is not a philosophy talk, so allow me to be very specific. What do I mean when I say that capital has overthrown or is in the process of overthrowing capitalism? We need to define our terms. What do we mean by capital and what do we mean by capitalism? Uh, Capitalism comes in many different formats. The capitalism of the 19th century has nothing to do with the capitalism of the Gilded Age, of the first couple of decades of the 20th century. That was the monopoly capital phase, uh, magnificently different to what preceded the Second Industrial Revolution and the rise of electromagnetism as the main force of nature driving the economy, as opposed to steam, which was the first Industrial Revolution. Uh, Then you had, after 1929, uh, the great financial collapse, 
the 2008 of the mid-war period, as I called 1929, um, you have uh, uh, the New Deal in the United States, you have the war economy that followed, uh, centrally, heavily centrally planned capitalist economy, which then gave rise to the Bretton Woods era, which was um, a remarkable experiment in combining capitalism with central planning at a global level. You had the Japanese economic miracle, which was uh, again another fascinating combination between Soviet Gosplan style central planning with privately owned conglomerates and financiers that were attached to them. Uh, then you had uh, the collapse of Bretton Woods and the rise of financialization. Uh, some people refer to this as a period of neoliberalism. I don't. I think there's nothing new to neoliberalism. There's nothing, there's nothing liberal about it either. Um, it was the rise of financial capital, of financial markets, uh, with um, the American economy uh, being sustained through a combination of um, an increasing trade deficit, budget deficit, and financialization. In other words, money printing, um, private money printing by Wall Street on that side of the Atlantic and the city of London, London on this side of the Atlantic. These are very different varieties of capitalism, very different varieties of capitalism. Uh, so capitalism transforms itself, it evolves. What keeps it capitalist? The one thing, the one thing, the two things, if you want, that um, uh, are permanent characteristics of all types of capital. The pylons that keep capitalism erect are two. The first one is profit. Feudalism was powered by ground rent, by rent. Capitalism was powered, lubricated, fueled uh, by profit. Uh, for the first time in the history of humankind, we have uh, profit driving the system. So profit is one pylon of capitalism as the major fuel driving the engines of its political economy. The second intertemporal permanent characteristic of um, capitalism is markets. Not that markets did not pre-exist capitalism, of course they did, but the channeling of the bulk of economic activity, of production, of uh, the supply of labor, of um, uh, property rights in general through markets, labor markets, share markets, money markets, and so on. Uh, that's very distinct and very particular to capitalism. So profit and markets. Hmm? To make this point a little bit more um, succinctly and to il illustrate a little bit more, under feudalism, most work, 99% of work, did not participate in any labor market. Peasants worked. They never rented their lab labor to anyone. Uh, they produced a harvest. The landlord would send the sheriff and collect a percentage of the harvest. There's no market involved in that. It's pure exploitation, just rent, ground rent. Um, where rent becomes very easy to recognize by the naked eye <laughs> because you can see the extraction the moment the sheriff collects a percentage of the harvest on behalf of the landlord. No market there. Uh, the commodification of labor required, the enclosures in Britain, these are all you know, well-known uh, moments in uh, the economic history which has yielded capitalism, has delivered capitalism from the, um, the belly of feudalism. My hypothesis, going back to my crazy hypothesis, <laughs> is that both these pillars of capitalism have been either knocked down or cut down to size. And that begins in 2008. And I shall back up my claim uh, in two ways. 
what has replaced profit? Since 2009, to be precise, April of 2009, uh, most of the fueling, driving, and lubrication of the global exploitative system that we live under, which we used to call capitalism, most of that lubrication and driving has been shifted from profit to central bank printed money. Hmm? Uh, without the gazillions of monies printed by the Fed, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Switzerland, the Bank of Sweden, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Sweden, and so on and so forth, uh, capitalism would have gone to a halt. Uh, and this was the very first time in the history of capitalism that it was not private profit, but central bank money printing, which uh, kept the machinery of capitalism going. Uh, there's a lot more to say about this, uh, but I won't, because I want to move to the second uh, point, that markets are steadily being replaced as the spaces in which selling and exploitation take place. And I shall give you a very brief example, but I think a very poignant one. The moment you visit a website like Amazon.com, it doesn't have to be Amazon.com, it could be the Chinese version, Alibaba, it could be any number of similar sites, um, you know, market sites they're called, or sales uh, digital sites. The moment you enter Amazon.com, you exit the market. Uh, it's not a marketplace. It's not even correct, analytically correct, to say that what happens when you enter Amazon.com is that you are effectively entering a privatized or private market. Even a private market. Imagine a shopping mall out there, which is owned by one person or one company. Is nothing like Amazon.com. The equivalent of Amazon.com in the physical analog world would be you and I walking down some street, some market street. Huh? Imagine a world like, like a science fiction movie. Imagine you and I are walking down a street and our heads and our eyes are turned to one particular spot. Hmm? And what you see is not the same thing as what I see. Because what you see and what I see is determined by an algorithm which knows our past history of likes, dislikes, purchases, um, loves, hatreds, whatever. And it shows us different products at different prices while we're walking together. <laughs> so if you and I now, if all of us, all those of us were in Zoom, we, if we log on together at Amazon.com and we put something down, like for instance, you know, um, suggest a product for me to buy for the house, each one of us is going to get a different recommendation. <laughs> so the algorithm um, is part of um, a new form of capital, which is the apotheosis, the pinnacle of dialectical capital. Those of you who know what dialectical means, uh, will immediately understand what I'm saying. Those of you who are not familiar with the term, don't worry about it. I will explain it um, in uh, more detail as follows. Uh, you may be familiar, since I'm talking about Amazon, you may be familiar with a device that sits on your desk. You can buy it from Amazon. It's called Alexa. Hmm? And it's supposed to be a digital servant. Uh, it has voice recognition. I've got one here. Uh, you can ask it to do things like, you know, order milk for your fridge, order books, suggest movies, uh, switch on and switch off your lights, your garage gate if you've got one, um, do things for you. Except, of course, that Alexa is not your servant. It is part of this broader blend of hardware, you know, optic fiber, cell phone towers, satellites, uh, servers, server farms, and software algorithms in particular. Uh, in such a way does it work that essentially what this um, 
Alexa device is doing is it uses you to train it to know you so that it can surprise you with useful to you suggestions and moves so that you get used to getting good advice from Alexa so that next time Alexa on behalf of the owner of the algorithm uh, that lives in this cloud of uh, combination of hardware and software um, next time it on behalf of its owner tells you you know you should buy this or you should do that you are much more agreeable to these suggestions so you've got this new form of capital i call it cloud capital because it is a combination of algorithms and hardware and it is completely and utterly dialectical in the sense that you are working or doing things to train it so that it trains you to train it to train you to train it to train you to train it ad infinitum that's the dialectical part so as in the end to maximize the power of its owner Jeff Bezos in the case of, of Amazon to sell you what the owner thinks is best for him that you should buy in the process the capitalist who owns the company that will produce the thing that you will buy doesn't have direct access to you, doesn't have access to you through any market. You and all the other customers and all the other capitalists are completely separated and kept apart by this algorithm that belongs to one man who simultaneously charges you to sell you and charges the capitalist who has produced the stuff, 30% more or less, thereabouts is the percentage, a fee, a ground rent, a ground digital rent, I call it the cloud rent, that I think goes quite well with the idea of cloud capital, huh? uh, for that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall put it to you, this is my hypothesis, that Amazon.com is not a market, it is a fief, a fiefdom. It is a digital fiefdom, a cloud fiefdom, belonging to one man who has the capacity to end any notion of market, individuate all buyers and all sellers, treat the sellers as vassals, remember the term vassal from feudalism, vassal capitalists, and to treat each one of us as simultaneously uh, a peasant, <laughs> a member of their cloud fief, and <clears throat> an unpaid producer. Because every time you do anything that Alexa um, picks up on, you are contributing to the cloud capital of Jeff Bezos. You are enriching the capital. For the first time in the history of, let's continue to call it for, for a moment, capitalism, capital is produced outside the labor process, outside the labor market. Up until very recently, <clears throat> capital was produced at the factory, at the workshop, inside the shop, the architectural office. Hmm? How? The capitalist, the owner of the means of production, of the factory, the shop, the office, whatever, hmm? uh, the entrepreneur would hire you. It would pay you a wage reflecting the value of your labor power or labor time and your skills. Would get from you the living force, your own labor ideas, you know, designs, whatever, that fed into the commodities, goods and services that the company produced, which gave them value, market value, exchange value. And the difference between the two values, the exchange value of the commodities, was, was, which was created by your own quicksilver, labor power and ingenuity, hard work, um, diligence, and so on, and the value of your labor time, which was your wage, the difference between the two was your surplus value. Or the surplus value you contributed to the firm. From that surplus value, the employer, the capitalist, would pay the banker rent, uh, interest, the landlord ground rent, and the rest would be profit from which, uh, or a part of which, would be reinvested in new capital. That was capital accumulation. So the labor process, the production of surplus value by wage labor, was an essential aspect of creating new capital. Hmm? That's gone now. I mean, it's it's already happened. It, it, of course, it is happening, because when a worker works in an Amazon warehouse 
to help ferry the stuff that you buy from Amazon.com. This is the old fashioned uh, proletarian labor at work. Uh, and yes, the same algorithm that runs your Alexa, that runs your Amazon.com software, that runs our, uh, the software on our phone and so on, also runs a little gadget that the Amazon warehouse worker has on her or on him, telling them exactly where to go, which packet to pick up, where to deliver it, at what pace, monitors them. It's like Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, the movie, only digitized, but it's the same algorithm, the same cloud capital, which also trains you to train it, to train you on what to buy. What I just described, is increasingly, not just in the United States or Europe, in Kenya, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, the model of um, buying, selling, exploiting, and accumulating capital. And this is outside the market process. It happens and it unfolds in what I call digital fiefs or cloud fiefs. Now, if you put together Everything I've said so far, that is the replacement of um, profit as the driver of the system with central bank money, state money, the replacement of markets with cloud fees, the conversion of increasing percentages of the population into cloud serfs, people who actually work for no pay, to produce cloud capital for this new ruling class that own cloud capital, which is not the same ruling class that owns machinery anymore, you know, physical capital. If you add to that the fact that um, artificial intelligence is going to increase the capacity of the owners of cloud capital to extract values in this non-market, non-capitalist, but what I call techno-feudal manner, you're coming close to the crazy idea that occupies me these days and which I have to um, sum up in this book that my publisher is constantly on my case to finish. Uh, one last thing before we have a conversation. Uh, because I'm sure there are many questions and objections and uh, uh, counterpoints. The <clears throat> situation that we've had after the pandemic with an inflationary bout, an inflationary spasm of this global economy uh, gives rise to a number of objections to my theory, to my hypothesis, on the basis that, ah, the central bank money that you were talking about, Yanis, which did indeed keep capitalism afloat between 2009 and 2000, 2021, is gone now because inflation is forcing central banks to stop printing money. Uh, this is a very interesting counterpoint, but it's not convincing because as we have found out <laughs> in the recent months and recent weeks, the central banks can't do that. They claim to be ready to do it. They claim that they wake up in the morning and they go to bed at night dreaming of um, eliminating the central bank mine money, which is running the system. But they know very well that it is impossible to find a rate of interest in the global economy, which simultaneously equilibrates the money markets, therefore stabilizes in inflation, and prevents an awful domino effect that will fell big tech, the conglomerates around the world, uh, the banking sector, and of course, the housing market. So now they are in a complete conundrum. The possibility, they all recognize that they need to roll back the money printing. But if they roll back the money printing, global capitalism is gone. At a time of mounting geopolitical pressures, there's a lot to say about China, about the way that the Chinese have anticipated this with their own digital currency. But to, you know, to 
contain myself so as to leave room for um, Q and A. Uh, I am increasingly succeeding in convincing myself <laughs> that there is something in my hypothesis that um, without even realizing it, we have shifted from something that is identifiable as capitalism to something that is identifiable as techno-feudalism. Now, words matter, ladies and gentlemen. What we call this beast matters. The moment, for instance, after February, March of 2020, we called COVID-19 a pandemic. It played a role in helping the world, um, you know, uh, focus, concentrate its mind on the task ahead. Words are crucial. So if you and me were having a conversation like this one, let's say in the 1770s or 1780s in England, where the Industrial Revolution was underway, at the time when Adam Smith uh, was writing his Wealth of Nations, the first textbook, if you want, on the transformation of feudalism into something resembling a market economy, a market society, capitalism. If back then in the 1770s, 1780s, even if we were in Manchester, in Glasgow, in Liverpool, in Birmingham, where the Industrial Revolution was underway, wherever we looked, outside our moldy windows, we would see feudalism. We would see feudal lords sitting in the House of Lords, in the House of Commons even, hmm? running the army, running the government, running everything. If we crossed the channel back then into continental Europe, we would find nothing but feudalism. Even in the 1840s, that is, you know, 60 years later, when Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in the uh, remarkable document known as the Communist Manifesto were waxing lyrical about the bourgeois mode of production, about how um, capitalism was bringing down the Great Wall of China uh, using not cannons, but the power of the, pr the low prices of their commodities. Even when they were writing all that, well, that was a tiny little speck <laughs> compared to the feudal order at the time. Uh, capitalism was, was not triumphant. It was emerging, and Marx and Engels were remarkably prescient to see globalization when it hadn't really happened yet, <laughs> uh, to predict what was going to happen a, a hundred years later. Now, back then in the 1770s, 1780s, and this is how I finish, um, astute observers of the political economy of Britain where and Amsterdam, where <laughs> capitalism was emerging, was um, you know, springing up from the woodwork, they could easily have called the new system industrial feudalism. They could have called it industrial feudalism. Feudalism, because it was everywhere, with industry. Or market feudalism. It would not have been wrong. I'm saying this because today is some of the good folk who uh, comment on my work and on my hypothesis, they say, Yanis, come on, it's still capitalism. Everywhere we look, we see capitalism. Maybe what we're seeing is hyper-capitalism or platform capitalism or entire capitalism, but it's still capitalism. Well, I don't think it is. And I think that we will be doing, especially the younger generation, and disservice if we don't have the guts, if we don't have the what it takes, the courage to say, folks, no, this is not capitalism anymore. Profits on the one hand and markets on the other have been sidestep, sidestepped by central bank money and by cloud thieves, platforms, uh, Amazons. If we do this, then we give the youngsters of today, the young theorists, the young activists, a better chance of organizing. Because those of us, and I'm speaking as somebody who's on the left, I don't know about you, but I am on the left. I was born a lefty and I will die a lefty. Um, we keep thinking in terms of organizing the proletariat. Now, it's important to organize the proletariat, people who work in Amazon warehouses, in factories, and so on. 
But if the locus of exploitation is now shifting to other realms, and if you have, you know, the kind of techno feudal order which manages to extract rents directly and bypassing labor markets, then our organization cannot be focused and confined to the factories, to the old style trade unions. We need some other kind of configuration of our collective action, and we need to rethink of how we can have the socialization of the means of production and distribution. When the means of production and distribution are increasingly cloud capital. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yanis, uh, for this uh, pleasant presentation. Uh, I guess we can start taking questions. Um, while you were speaking, uh, someone, uh, let me see, if you look at the chat, you can see that yourself also. Sven Carlson, I guess, uh, made an objection uh, at some point, uh, claiming that uh, printing money printing at zero lower bound period is not that significant. I don't know if you want to respond to that comment. And there are others who are uh, asking questions. Uh, uh, what I see is uh, Jose Gabriel Palma, and I'm going to allow him to ask this question. Please go. For you, for me to start? Yeah. Yes, Jose. Uh, Yanis, uh, a pleasure always listening to you. Uh, two things. One, in the case of Amazon, I mean, you didn't have time probably I mean, I'm sure you're aware of this. You didn't have time to go to another side of Amazon, which also joins very well with what you said. I mean, my son was the president of the Writers Association in Britain for two periods, and all his time he was fighting with Amazon because the and Amazon was quite open about this. The business model of Amazon in the in the in the publication, in the novel, in the literature side, is to run down and get rid of all the publishers on one side and all the libraries on the other. Mm -hmm. Meaning their business model is that they want to be the only, only entity between a writer and a reader. Mm -hmm. So if a writer wanted to write a book, has to publish it with Amazon, has to sell the book by Amazon, and then the reader gets that book. Meaning the the issue of the whole production process, uh, which is the other side of Amazon, which you didn't have time to go into, is also part of this uh, the system that you're working. Because imagine a world in which there is only one entity between the writer and the and the publisher and the and the reader. So basically, the reason my son got involved because the writer association is the union of the writers of this country, Britain. And obviously they are going to be completely at the mercy, I mean, another <laughs> serves um, another of this uh, giant called Amazon, who will be the only publisher that will be able, where they will be able to publish their work. So this other side that Amazon is not only happy to be the, to get, to get the rents on the selling side, uh, the markup from the producers, but they are also, and also that happened in other with other multinationals, that they are also moving on the on the on the production side, and they are basically, I mean, the whole market of literature will be done in just. No, no, I, understand, I understand, I understand. But let me say very quickly, Jose, because there are quite a few. I mean. We could talk about it this forever, but very briefly, this particular dimension of Amazon's uh, strategy, business model, is not different to monopoly capital. Monopoly capitalists have been doing this for youngs. They've been trying to corner markets, and they've been trying to be monopoly, monopolist and monopsonist at the same time. What I find, uh, so Standard Oil is a, is, is a very good example of, you know, pre-1925 of uh, a complete monopoly that was imposed upon almost every state in the United States for oil. 
Uh, and they did something similar to what you're saying. They tried to close everybody else down and to make sure that everybody bought oil from them and that they would buy oil from every single um, you know, Texan who had a little bit of oil in their backyard. What I find astonishing is the algorithm which manages simultaneously to train us to want things that um, are consistent with our preferences so it has a very intimate, this algorithm has a very intimate relationship with us, with our soul. And with artificial intelligence, this is going to get increasingly weirder. While at the same time, the same algorithm drives the workers inside the Amazon work, warehouse and replaces the marketplace, completely replaces the marketplace. That, and then add the dimension of monopoly capitalism that, that you brought in, and you have a monster, a complete and utter monster. Now, can I, while you're preparing the next speaker or questioner, uh, Sven Carlson said in the chat, the amount of money grows, but velocity of money slows correspondingly. So money printing at the zero lower bound period is not that significant. Sven, I have to say that clearly you have been inflicted by an education in economics. This is not a good thing. You've got to deprogram yourself. Okay, you think in terms of the quantity theory of money equation. Don't. Because this quantity of theory of money equation does not take into consideration either money markets or debt markets. What has been happening over the last 13 years is that the money printed huh, is not being spent. It doesn't go to consumers. It doesn't join you know, the real market economy. What happens is it goes from the Fed to the Bank of America, from the Bank of America to some corporation. The corporation then uses this, mon this money not to produce stuff, huh? not for circulation purposes, but goes to, the, to Wall Street and buys back it, its own shares to increase its share price. Okay? And then their bonus goes up with it. So don't think in terms of economic textbooks because then you will be led astray. So it really makes a difference whether money is being printed um, in, in large quantities. But um, I'm back to the, to the chair to give the floor to somebody else. Um. May I just make a short comment uh, about what you said? One particular aspect of this quiz, at least, at least uh, the uh, Bank of England and the uh, initially Bank of England and the Fed did uh, uh, was that they purchased these assets uh, from uh, non-bank financial institutions. So the money went to the non-bank financial institutions, which then uh, used that money for. Uh, um, speculating on assets and other asset purchases, uh, which led to this uh, asset price inflation. And of course, since it's not GDP generating, it doesn't show up in the velocity of money equation. That's asset price inflation. Asset price inflation. But, oh, you know, yeah. but this is how Jeff Bezos has built up Amazon. You know, mm -hmm. how, how did Elon Musk buy Twitter? On the basis of the valuation, of the increased valuation of his shares. Yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, I guess uh, the first person who raised his hand was uh, Argun. Uh, let's start with him, then Dalar, then Steve. Okay. Thank you, professor, and thank you, Mr. Varoufakis, for this speech and your time. And actually, my question is on value from the book that you have written, Brief History of Capitalism. In that book, you are quoting Oscar Wilde as a clinical person is the one who knows the value of, uh, who knows the price of everything, but not the value. So that's easy for me when I make investments in financial markets. At least I can do a DCF analysis and I can find an intrinsic value and I can compare that with the price in the market. But in terms of capitalism, could you please dwell on this exchange value and experiential value that you mentioned in the book? Thank you. Well, let me suggest that since you play the, the markets, um, try not to believe your models too much because your models work um, when there's no crisis and your models are programmed to assume that there will be no crisis. So mm, be careful. <laughs> um, having said that, look, the, 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 the capitalism can be thought in terms of the constant triumph or triumphant march of exchange value over experiential value. Things that didn't have a price, suddenly acquired the price. So, you know, I'm 62. I still remember my grandmother 
you know, baking bread for the household. That had no exchange value. It was not created in order to be sold. Um, you know, she was making clothes for us. Um, and I'm sure in Turkey you have the same thing, right? We have the same Ottoman experience or Byzantine experience, whatever, you know, common experience. Um, uh, and increasingly, hmm, you have this steady expansion imperialism of the realm of price, taking over the realm of value. That's one way of thinking it, of it. Another way of thinking of it is the expansion of the realm of profit over rent. Rent was never pushed aside, but it was defeated and profit ran the system. And now what I think we have is we have the opposite. We have the uh, return of rent, but a particular kind of rent, cloud rent, which is how I defined it. Simultaneously, at the level of experiences, it used to be the case for, for a liberal economist, a liberal politician, a liberal person, huh? John Stuart Mill. What really mattered was personal autonomy. The reason why they loved capitalism, the free market, and they were very skeptical about socialism, for instance, was because they believed that uh, you needed uh, checks and balances, you needed to build a fence around the person to preserve the personal space from government, from other people, from trade unions, from, from anyone, all right? Um, but look at what's going on now. With the algorithm, the what I call cloud capital, interfacing with us uh, at the level of our emotions, right? Um, people, you know, it used to be a good marketer, a good advertiser, try to impart character to a commodity. So Steve Jobs was good because he made, you know, my laptop have a character, you know, my, my MacBook, right? Or my iPhone. I don't have an iPhone. I hate iPhones, but, you know, some of you like them, right? So he gave a character to the phone. And now what's happening is this is being reversed. Cloud capital is shaping our character. Young people, especially, you know, students, uh, my daughter's age in Australia, in Greece, in Turkey, I'm sure, they constantly worry about the future. And that means they hear the, the new mantra of Silicon Valley, which is, you know, what does Google tell its employees? Be yourself. You know, don't, you know, be original. Like, be spontaneous, which is ridiculous because, you know, it's a contradiction in terms to be told to be spontaneous. <laughs> uh, find what you love. Don't follow rules. Make your own. This is sounds very liberal, doesn't it? But it creates a huge uncertainty in the mind, in the soul of youngsters who try to find out what it means to be spontaneous. You know, the, what's my identity? Um, I need to find an identity. So they constantly go on the same algorithms of the social media, trying to talk to other kids through Instagram, through TikTok, and so on about their identity. So they are constantly manufacturing an identity which later on they will try to sell. And they will sell it because... In any interview that takes place now, before you're being interviewed, especially as a young person, the interviewer, sometimes it's an algorithm, <laughs> uh, but even if it's a real person, will have checked your social media. So there's never any personal space. You know, even in the middle of the night when you tweet something or you put something on Instagram, you are manufacturing yourself as a product to be sold to some employer. That is the complete defeat of liberalism. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Yunis. And uh, Dawlar is next. My question is about um, your hypothesis seems to uh, dwell a bit on the efficiency of those algorithms, or it requires those algorithms to be at least uh, strong in their ability to discover personal preferences or enhance them. If these algorithms are bullshit, and if they're not that good, and there is a hype around them, around artificial intelligence that we are maybe not seeing right now. Perhaps this beast may not be as scary as you uh, think, and it might be <clears throat> like the Zuckerberg's uh, Meta, which was a very brief uh, product or whatever you want to call it, that was marketed, and it seemed that people don't have... Dagler, I've got bad news. Dagler, I have very bad news. These, these algorithms are very good, very good. When Spotify suggests music for me, it's usually music I love. 
uh, Amazon knows what books I want and always charges me more than anybody else for the books that I want. If you and I, if I tell you to log on and ask for the book that I want, not one you want, uh, believe me, it will charge you lower prices than me. So they're very good, these algorithms, and they are getting better at an exponential rate. As for Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg has the right idea. Now, it's very like, it's possible that Zuckerberg will go bust because he's investing everything he has in the metaverse, in his conversion of Facebook into metaverse. Maybe that won't work. But the metaverse is going to be a hugely lucrative enterprise. Maybe somebody else is going to benefit from it. Remember in 2001 when we had the dot-com explosion? Lots of companies invested in technologies and then went bust. But those technologies, in the end, were used by Zuckerberg <laughs> and the other ones who were very successful. Um, I remember I was giving a talk at Google at the main campus in California. Um, they invited me and I went and I really loved it uh, because I got an opportunity to, say to, 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 to um, congratulate them for their algorithms, especially for the algorithm of the Google search engine, which is remarkable. Absolutely astonishing, right? Especially now with machine learning and reinforcement learning and so on. Um, look at the way that Google Translate has improved massively over the last months, not years. Um, and I said to them, you know, congratulations, you've been so good. Your algorithms are so fantastic. You have invented a new human right, the right to use the Google search engine. The problem when you invent a human right, however, is that you are no longer ethically uh, justified to own it. So we need to nationalize you. That didn't go down very well. So that was going to be my follow-up. That what's the solution? But you also already said it. Ah, this is, we don't have time for the solutions. We need another meeting for that. I've okay. written a science fiction novel in which I try to to answer that. I call it another now, because yeah, only was a science fiction novel could I possibly answer that question. <laughs> um, okay. Um, thank you, Yanis, for that answer. Now let's turn to Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey, okay, Janus. Hi, hey, old man. Good, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, and to Michael there as well. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, I'm just actually going to Joe, ask one little point, and that is, have you distinguished quantitative easing for banks for quantitative easing for non-banks in your description of money printing by central banks? Yes, of course. But, you know, it's money printing is, 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 is a, a kind of huge Amazon of a river. Yeah. yeah. And then there are many different uh, riverlets um, that, that create different kinds of problems. So the... Ah, you are screen sharing, Steve. I am screen sharing. And I want ah, to show ah, you just... I'm okay. setting up Minsky to show this sort of thing. So if you have... Uh, basically, the deficit creates money. Bond mm -hmm. sales to banks do not create money. They change what backs money. Bond sales by banks to non-banks destroy money. And QE with with um, by the central bank with banks just changes the asset. It doesn't create doesn't create or destroy money. Only the QE with non banks creates money. So sure. that's a little clarifying. If, if, if that's as long as you've got that, I'm happy. Okay, that's a lot of shit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Abs absolutely, Good. absolutely. But then again, you know, the distinction between banks and non banks is not as cut yeah. and dry as uh, they claimed after 2008 that it is. I basically think banks invented non-banks as they could speculate on assets. They were allowed to speculate exactly. on banks, and most exactly. of the money goes back to the banks. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there are no Chinese words between the bank and non-bank part of a bank, as you know. Oh, only, for the, only for the auditors to point out when necessary. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I just saw that Michael Hudson is here. Michael, good to see you. I, you know, there are too many little um, <laughs> little windows here. It's good to be here, and I'm uh, glad to hear uh, we're on the same path of what we're talking about. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing that I would like to say, however, is that um, I agree with Steve that uh, that when they conducted these QEs, uh, not initially, indeed, uh, what ECB did wasn't even a QE in the beginning. They started doing QE. That is, purchase, started purchasing bonds from non-bank financial institutions later. Uh, but initially, both the Bank of England, both Bank of England and the Fed um, 
probably more than 95% of the purchases they made from non-bank financial institutions, which increased the broad money. If they bought those uh, bonds directly from the banks, uh, or uh, only the, uh, the bonds that the banks uh, uh, owned at the time, it would only increase the reserves. It wouldn't have any impact uh, on the broad money, uh, which was the main <laughs> aim of the scheme. That's why there was no inflation. inflation. That's why there was no inflation. Precisely, but because... There was massive price inflation. Yeah, they, were, you, they were struggling to create inflation and failing. I mean, how dumb do you have to be as a central banker? <laughs> Most definitely don't. Nine, 12 years to create inflation. Yeah, you are it, failing, and that then suddenly inflation hits you over the head like a blunt instrument. And then you heard Christine, Christine Lagarde. She she was being interviewed last week. And yeah. so they asked her, um, where did this inflation come from? And you, did you hear what she said? From nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Uh, anyway, uh, we have two more questions and four minutes. So let's not waste time. Okay. Alev is the next person who wants to ask a question. Go, Alev. Alev. Hi, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about um, the e-commerce platforms or big tech. Uh, although we call them multinationals, they are, I would say they are mainly US companies. Uh, we call them multinationals because they go to places where they can pay the minimum tax, um, but they are mostly US. With regard to data collection, uh, storing data in cloud and data privacy, uh, I guess you would agree with me that US and EU have very different positions. That US is towards uh, more liberal policies as the um, profits being accumulated at the very end is in US. Uh, and uh, EU is more towards a protectionist stance. How well, that's very simple. This will impact the future of techno federalism. Of what? Ah. Um, well, look, let's face it Europe, the European Union, has spectacularly failed to produce big tech companies. The only non American country or bloc that has produced big tech companies is China. They went out of the way to make sure, uh, through protectionism and through massive internal domestic investment, that they create the equivalent of uh, Amazon, the equivalent of Google, the equivalent of Facebook, the equivalent of Twitter, and they created TikTok on top of that. <laughs> they are the only ones. The, this is a fundamental reason for the new Cold War that Trump started, and now Biden is turbocharging. Uh, Trump was very clear. He wanted to bring down the Chinese walls that protected Chinese big tech from American big tech. Uh, and that was one thing he wanted. And the other thing was to conquer uh, Chinese finance um, on behalf of Wall Street. This, this was the reason why the, the new Cold War began and is the reason why Biden is continuing it today. Um, with Europe, they had no such problem because <laughs> there wasn't a single competitor to big tech. Uh, and the, if Vestager, Commissioner Vestager, is more protectionist, is because uh, she can be in the sense that there isn't a single European company that is affected by the protectionism, by her attempts to protect the, you know, the European citizen or the, the, the European um, consumer. But look at the contempt with which European deep power, the European deep state, is treating the European Commissioner. Every single time she has tried to impose some kind of fine on, uh, you know, Amazon, on Google, on this, the European Court of Justice strikes it down. That's <laughs> illegal in Europe. You know, I mean, it is astonishing. American hegemony is growing. Uh, the more uh, the American uh, GDP over global GDP ratio shrinks. So, you know, this... That's never happened in the history of humanity. For a country like America to increase its hegemony, okay, in proportion to its trade deficit and to the shrinking of its GDP. Okay. Uh, I love you, Ardana, I suppose, right? One, one more by Ali, Ali Mohammed, who's yeah. had his hand 
nicely raised for a while now. We can do that, yeah, and, and then I move on. Yes, sir. Hello there. Uh, this is my first time attending your conference. I would like to uh, thank my professor for uh, introducing me actually to your books. I, I have never heard of you before. I am a senior student, and this is like the new generation speaking. So uh, my professor is uh, Imre Demir from uh, like TED University. And what I would like to ask is this question. I would like to contribute to your hypothesis, perhaps. Uh, what do you think? Because you mentioned that the uh, like the algorithm created is uh, like separating the, the the owner, let's say, the, who you call the Lord, the feudal Lord, in a sense, the owner of the how can you say the cloud uh, fiefdom, which you which you mentioned. What do you think if actually the the algorithm is not actually indirectly affecting the consumer, but the the Lord in this sense is directly involved in the creation of demand. So how can I put this simply is that when you mentioned, for example, an, uh, like Amazon gives you the books which you like and given that I have some technological knowledge in that sense, perhaps Amazon has created that liking for you. What do you think about that aspect? Because the real, well, the, the, I'm sorry, the reality, what I'm trying to say is that perhaps reality in this sense, to put it very science fictionally, your reality is in a sense created for you that you believe perhaps that this is the demand that you wish to uh, like pursue. And from a market, from your perspective of market society, which I have read in your book, perhaps this is a new level of market society where this system actually creates your demand rather than waits for you to uh, provide a demand with it, speaking from a very uh, like politically kind of perspective. I wanted to hear your opinion sure. on that. Actually. I like this is a very good question. Very good question. Let me say that um, from the beginning of advertising, the whole yeah. point was to manufacture your desires. This is not new. The manufacture of desire um, is as old as uh, the second industrial revolution and mass production, Henry Ford style mass production of monopoly capital. The moment you have the conglomerate, the conglomerate has super profits, monopoly profits. It can invest in smart ways of influencing what you want. So it manufactures simultaneously the car and your desire for the car, all right? The gadget and your desire for the gadget. This is old. This is 100 years old, at least, right? There's nothing new there. Anybody who's watched uh, that great American TV series, Mad Men, um, which maps out through the character of Don Draper, um, the you know evil genius um, um, mercurial guy who occasionally has brilliant ideas about advertisements that succeed in selling uh, things as characterful products. We have seen this. Uh, this is precisely the process in the 1950s and 60s in particular of marketization, of um, having whole departments of professionals, the purpose of which were to manufacture our desires. That's not new. What is new with algorithmic capital is that Don Draper's job is now turned over to an algorithm. It is capitalized. A new form of capital is producing your desires. And that form of capital is also produced by you. That's the dialectical infinite regress. This is new. Uh, um, Ali, you got the answer? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your contribution. Great. I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yanis, there is one last question, uh, and it's in the chat. Sinan asked this. If you have uh, any time, uh, and if you can answer that, that would be great. Uh, do you have that time? Let me read it from uh, Sinan. Yeah, Has Sinan Haskell. Hmm. First of all, I would like, okay, I have two questions. Do you mean a uniform techno-feudalism? No, no, there's not, nothing uniform happens across the world. <laughs> Capitalism was not uniform, right? So it's not uniform, uh, but it's everywhere. Not uniform, but everywhere. I was uh, looking at uh, developments in Malaysia today uh, where the, um, uh, you know, if you travel across Malaysian or Indonesian roads, you'll, you'll see lots of uh, stalls selling everything from phone cards to, you know, soft drinks and so on. They are all being taken over by techno feudal lords. Uh, so you see it everywhere, but not in the same form, not uniformly. 
can we say that different varieties of techno-feudalism is emerging? Yes, we can. Of course, there is one in China. I mean, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, the, the Chinese one is a fantastic example of a precisely this heterogeneity. Uh, President Xi, uh, who now got his third term recently, um, came out with a manifesto of um, reining in big tech, the techno-feudal power of certain uh, you know, cloudalists, you know, owners of cloud capital in, in China. So there is a clear clash now between the Chinese Communist Party and the big tech that the Chinese Communist Party created. <laughs> How this will pan out, who knows? But nothing as interesting as that is happening in Europe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, one more message came, but I I think you are. Uh, oh, it says thank you. Thank okay. You. Can I can I can I thank you too for attending for inviting me, and let me as a Greek, speaking to my friends in Turkey, say that it is imperative to have solidarity with each other, because 